Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Pop Culture Galaxy Podcast. I'm Mark Bridge, and I'm here with Zach Wojner. I run while others walk. <laughs> so, uh, we're continuing with our James Bond retrospective, and to, in this episode we're going to be talking about Thunderball, um, which is, uh, as I guess at the time, the most expensive one. Nine million dollar budget. Yeah. And at the time, I don't think anyone I think there's more movies that pass it in terms of uh running time. This one was two hours and fifteen minutes, which is the longest. Something like that. Yeah. And guess what, Zach? Guess what? What? It is the first one to use the cinemascope aspect ratio. Yep. <laughs> yep. I noticed that right away and was like, oh, here we are. Yeah. So it it, it, it fully made its way from a popcorn movie. And you could tell by just everything that was in it to a straight cinematic experience. Um, higher level of bond we're talking about here. Um, so... We already talked about the budget, nine million. Uh, box office wise, it made a hundred and forty one, so it killed it box office wise. Uh, it was wise. huge. Adjusted for inflation, it's still like the highest grossing Bond movie. Bond movie, yeah. I mean, it's almost like why deal with inflation because it was a different time then, you know. Yeah, da, 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 I, I, I agree. I definitely agree because. There's so much that's not taken into account when yeah. you adjust for inflation. Mm -hmm. Like, is a movie more popular in the city or in the country right. because it's cheaper there? So whenever, you know, in the last, like, 20 years, mm -hmm. I don't really put that much stock in inflation. Yep, yep. But um, when you go back, way back, it's it's nice to see... You know, I wish that they would just count ticket sales yeah. separately instead of forcing you to do math that may or may not be accurate based yep. on average ticket prices. Mm -hmm. um, and 3D, they don't take that into account. IMAX, 4D, whatever that is. Yeah. Nobody even knows what that is, but they'll pay an extra $10 for it. I mean, you know why they don't do, do ticket counts. Because... Well, yeah, because they, cause movies don't make more than they used to. Yeah. Yeah, so it's like they'll, you probably see a decline in ticket sales, and it'll just be bad press. So might as well just mm -hmm. do box office numbers, which you know, at the end of the day, money is key, right? Yeah, and, and I do. I love the box office numbers. I follow them all the time. Every day, I'm checking box office mojo yeah. just to see. Yeah. But um, you know, I'd like to have uh, ticket sales as well. Mm -hmm. Um. So. Uh, as far as this film is concerned, it was shot uh, mainly in the Bahamas. Uh, NASA. And uh, uh, it was released... I think this one was the first, because I thought Goldfinger was one first one to be released almost day and day uh, worldwide. Um, but this one, I think, was... the first, I mean, not day and day, but all in December in the major territories uh, of 1965. Now... Let's talk about the inception of this uh, film. Oh, or, yeah. Or rather, the novel. Uh, both. Yeah, both. Um, Thunderball started out as Ian Fleming's first attempt yep. to make a James Bond movie. Yeah. Uh, he worked with Kevin McClory and some other guy, <laughs> um, whose name I can't remember. Yeah. Williamson? Uh, but, Jack, uh, Jack Whittington, Whitting, Whittingham. Whittingham, I was yeah. close. Yeah. But uh, he worked with them to develop a screenplay mm -hmm. called Thunderball. And Kevin McClory contributed many important ideas to that. Mm -hmm. um, and they collaborated on, on another film. And that film kind of bombed. Mm -hmm. So they kind of lost interest in Thunderball. Yeah. So while they were developing this movie, however, Ian Fleming was writing a novel. Uh oh kind of a novelization of his, his own movie, mm -hmm. you know, developing them at the same time. Uh, and so the movie got canceled, mm -hmm. but the book came out and became his next novel, Thunderball, and it's credited solely to Ian Fleming, yep. uh, which was a mistake. Yeah. Um, 
you know, even though he wrote it, you know, some of the ideas from it came from this, you know, would be Hollywood producer. Yeah. Uh, and so when it came time to a- adapt um, for the screen, mm-hmm. uh, Kevin McClory said, oh, I came up with the idea for Thunderball. So I want to make my own movie. I want to have the rights to James Bond and do a Thunderball movie. And of course, uh, Saltzman and Broccoli, the Eon producers who were doing these Bond movies, were like, oh, no, 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 no. You cannot do that. That would not be good for us or for you, if you know what I'm saying. If you know what's good for you. <laughs> uh, so they went to court. It was a big deal. Um, and it was a compromise, but basically, Kevin McClory won. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, he got the rights to Thunderball, right. which is why he's prominently credited as producer in the credits for Thunderball. Right. Um, but also, you know, he, him getting the rights to it left the door open for in the future to make another version of Thunderball, mm-hmm. which uh, we will see in about 20 years yeah, about 20 years <laughs> um, from 1965. Yeah. But we'll get there when we get there. Mm-hmm. But uh, basically, Ian Fleming didn't do his due diligence. Kevin McClory saw an opportunity and he seized it. I think it's really easy to look at Kevin McClory as a bad guy mm-hmm. for a few different reasons. Um, one of which being kind of the way his the rights were tied up with Thunderball, mm-hmm. leading to the exclusion of Spectre and Blofeld right. for a long time. Um, and, you know, fans who want to see those characters in that organization were left in the cold for a really long time. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the other hand, the things that Bond did to, to move past that kind of may may have ultimately been the key to why Bond has survived for so long mm-hmm. and been able to stay fresh because it's had a different villain every single movie. Yeah. You know, we haven't even met Blofeld yet, technically, but, um, you know, in the post-Connery era, which we'll be getting to in the coming weeks, mm-hmm. you'll see how, how the series moved past Blofeld and Spectre, which are this uh, organization throughout all of these Sean Connery movies, except mm-hmm. for Goldfinger. Yeah. That um, you know, kind of define that era of Bond. Yeah. Um. And did you mention it was actually going to be the first movie? Before, yeah. Yeah. Basically, before Saltzman and Broccoli yeah. came along. No. Well, it was... wasn't it? Wasn't it that they wanted to do that movie as well? Uh, the, Harry Saltzman. They wanted to make Thunderball their first film, but they couldn't because of the rights issue, and then, then they switched to Doctor No. Um, that that could be it. I remember right. in, in the commentary, Terrence Young says that he had wanted to do Thunderball for that he had wanted to do Thunderball first, mm-hmm. uh, but then was ultimately glad that it worked out the way it did mm-hmm. because they didn't have the money to do it. He's like, if we did Thunderball in '62, it would have been uh, a cheap version of Thunderball. Right, right, right. I'm glad we got to do yeah. movie that wound up being the cheapest. Uh, and Thunderball, you can, you know, we'll, we'll get to it, but you can see all that money on screen. Jesus. Some people don't like it for that reason, but I think it's amazing. I think it's production wise, mm-hmm. maybe the best one, the best of Sean Connery. Shoot, like some of the stuff they did in the movie, I don't see studios doing anymore. They just re- relegate themselves to. To CGI or maybe a tank or a small tank or something, but that uh, underwater action is amazing and it holds incredible, up. Incredible, incredible. Um, and it's shot by the uh, by the creature from the Black Lagoon. The director? Of... No, the actual creature. <laughs> uh, the actor who played him, uh, I can't remember his name now. Oh right, because um, he you talk about the the guy who because they found him. What he did was he used to do like uh, Flipper and all those shows. Uh, directed those those little underwater sequences and they hired that that guy. You saying he was the actor? Yeah, well, he was the actor from Creature from the Black Lagoon, and he directed all of the underwater sequences. Yeah, yeah. In Thunderball. 
Um, yeah, it was it was amazing. Um, and then speaking of directors, uh, so Guy Hamilton, they wanted Guy Hamilton to come back, but he was. Ooh. I guess he said, you know, his excuse was, "I was exhausted from Golden Gold, Goldfinger." <laughs> Exhausted from being so bad. Go figure, and that he wanted to sort of like recharge, you know, because he didn't think he could bring anything new to the table. But luckily for uh, them, wait, first Rico Browning is the person who uh, the, who played the creature from the Black Lagoon and then directed the underwater sequences here. Right, Rico Browning. Yeah, yeah. So, um, luckily for the production team, um, Terrence Young was available again oh yeah and they brought him back and he came back with a vengeance he probably saw what guy hamilton did with goldfinger and was like you know what i can do better um and better he did like this one there was there was a lot of things in this movie that just reminded me of like those movies that parody james bond and one of the elements that they do is like the music when there's something sort of crazy that the villains are doing and you hear that sort of ominous music but it's just like really uh it's, it's blasted with the um like like saxophones and not well, not sax but like tubas the brass and brass yeah. yeah um and that sequence when the plane is being covered on the water by the net and i listen to that track and like holy shit that's a dope it's piece so of music. good um and and then another thing too with the music, there was a lot of parts in it, especially in the auto, uh, uh, underwater se- fight sequence towards the end. You know, big battle. There was a portion of the music where it almost, if like you close your eyes, you you swear you were listening to a western. I'm like, this is a hard choice for John Barry to do. I wonder why. I mean, it still worked for the movie. I was just wondering why it he made it sound it's so old west sounding. You know, it was like. Yeah, I wonder if it's because it's like the first one where Bond is positioned as saving the girl more than the uh, than the actual mission at hand. Right. Like, right. yeah, he's got to stop these nukes, mm-hmm. but even this early on, they kind of realized that audiences are far more interested mm-hmm. in whether or not he's going to save the girl. Yeah. Yeah than whether or not he's going to save the world. Because they know he's going to save the world. Mm-hmm. But they don't necessarily know if he's going to save the girl. Yeah, because uh, it was touch and go there for a few with her. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, she, uh, she, she was getting beat up by and, Largo. And especially... Oh, poor Domino. And, this, and especially if you go off of what happened with in Goldfinger with one of the Bond girls when she... The gold when she died. So it's not like... And the two Mastersons, Masterson, right? Yeah. Uh, t- so basically, about three girls have died under his watch, pretty much. So yeah, it's anything can go with the Bond girl. So you know that was like the terrifying moment, um, so to speak. But um, let's let's go with the cast. I mean, the cast returns. Uh, you know, uh, Sean Connery back. This is his fourth, and uh, next one would be his last. Yeah, I think that, that Goldfinger's best strength was that Sean Connery was at the absolute top of his game. Mm-hmm. And Thunderball is the first one where he starts to look kind of old. Right. Like, I, I think he had a hairpiece even back in Goldfinger, mm-hmm. but I'm not 100% sure. But here it's pretty obvious that his hair looks just <laughs> different. Um, and there's less of it. Yeah. And... Um, you know, I mean, not that I'd want him to, to be bald on camera. That'd be gross. Mm-hmm. But, um, I mean, you know, I, I, I apologize to all bald people who are offended, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but, um, you know, he just looks a little more haggard. Mm-hmm. Not as much as he will in the next movie. And then Diamonds Are Forever. Forget about it. But um, you can – this is like the part, the, the port, part of his career where – I don't know what it was about his living. Mm-hmm. Maybe it was smoking or drinking or whatever, but it started, you know, age just started to hit him like a ton of bricks. To right. so the point where when they, ca- they cast Roger Moore because he was so much younger than 
Sean Connery, mm-hmm. except Roger Moore was older than Sean Connery. <laughs> It's, so it's weird. Yeah, it's so funny. But like, but if, but in La, Live and Let Die, he just looks so much younger than Sean Connery did at that point. Mm-hmm. You know, he just got so old so fast. It was weird. Hey, like it's he's he's Scottish. So I, I'm telling you, it's the it's the it's the um the Scotch. It was the Scotch that did it. Like he's it's the Scotch. Must be the Scotch. Like the way how they describe living on the set of these movies especially this one where after they wrap a scene or they're setting up another scene they would go back to their yacht and they would drink and uh sort of (laughs) have basically live in the high life pretty much Mm -hmm. um you know being socialites yeah sophisticated so, so that's what i'm saying it's like he and especially the fact that he got so popular off of this role where he had to become a, a a recluse and have just Playboy magazine and not <laughs> as the sort of number one uh, magazine to sort of uh, interview them on set. You know, he was he was he was doing it up, man. So, yeah, he this is one thing about when you sort of have that life where you don't sleep as much and you drink and you party, you can do a number on yourself. You know, you get old pretty quickly and. I have a feeling that's what really happened with him. I mean, it's worth it. Worth it for him. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sure he enjoyed his life as 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 Bond, and then post Bond because he's not like he stopped working as an actor. Yeah, no, not at all. But uh, and then uh, you know he's still around. He's retired. He doesn't want to do anything anymore. They tried to get him to do James Bond ten years ago, but he was like, nah, I don't want to. Yeah, that would have been so dope. They got the other guy. uh, I forgot his name. it's in Sky. It was in, supposed to be in Skyfall when they went to Scotland. Oh right, right. Yeah. Um, well, I'm actually I'm glad they didn't get get Sean Connery for that role. Al- Albert Finney. Yeah, Albert Finney. Yeah. But I mean, it was so it would have been so poetic though if it was like that I, scene. it would have been. But I'm of the opinion that like if you're gonna get one Bond, mm-hmm. you need to get them all. Oh. If you're gonna have one Bond make a cameo mm-hmm. and not another, then. It's like you're picking favorites. Well, and like even though everyone's favorite is Sean Connery, yeah, and yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think it necessarily would be the, because of the favorite. I mean, he was the first Bond, so that already that would be fitting. It was the thirtieth anniversary of the Bond films at the time. I want to say fiftieth. No, fiftieth. Sorry, I know it was one of the the Fs, <laughs> but it was the fiftieth yeah. anniversary, um, and they brought back. The Aston Martin, uh, DB5, so which was, was which pissed me off. So it was because like they they brought it back a bunch of times. Uh-huh. You know, Pierce Brosnan was driving around in that car, and they weren't like, "Oh, look at this, revere this." <laughs> Don't get me started on Skyfall. <laughs> Don't do it. All right, when we get to Skyfall, you can unleash your venom on Skyfall. Ugh. Um. So, uh, yeah, uh, uh Thunderball, um. Brought back Terrence Young. Um, Sean Connery's back. He wasn't dying. I thought the next one would be his last. Oh, he did die at Diamonds of Forever. The Diamonds are Forever. He was in that one. That was yeah, the last. Yeah, uh, he, he Diamonds are Forever was his last. Okay. But uh, he re- he had retired before then. They brought back George Lazenby, but then he unretired. Oh, okay. Oh, that's right. That's right. But yeah, technically the the last the next one was supposed to be his last. The, yeah. Um, okay. Because I, I, I was trying to sort of compare him to Craig, where Craig by the end of this one would be his fifth and last, like and and sort of the whole trajectory of their Bond movies, you know, with the sort of the middle child being the one that doesn't have to do with Spectre. Uh, I wonder if yeah. I wonder if Bond twenty five will have something to do with Spectre or. Um. Because Spectre is alive, right? He, did, didn't he get like arrested or some shit? Well, Blofeld, yeah. Yeah, the, the um, Bo- Blofeld. But um, Christoph Waltz is contracted to appear if it's a Daniel Craig movie. Okay. Doesn't mean that I think that he should, mm-hmm. but um, if they call him, he will answer. Okay. Got it. 
All right. Uh, the next person to return, Bernard Lee, of course, is uh, um, M, and uh, Desmond Llewellyn is Q. Lois Maxwell, she's getting up there, but hey, she still looks pretty. <laughs> um, as uh, I, and I love that Miss that scene. Funny. <laughs> They get a little more personality in this one that they didn't necessarily have before. There's that bit where. Money Penny is talking behind M's back, but he's right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh uh, yeah. He like, calls him the old man. Yeah, and, said, Don't and he's ever like, call me the old man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and they, like, there's that bit where you know, pretty much every time so far, Sean has opened the, the door to her office and thrown his hat, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. but sees that she has moved the the hat rack to right, right next to the door. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. he goes to throw it, but then it's right there so he just yeah, puts yeah. it down it's good it's a power move by money penny yeah. it's a very subtle power move um and there's also that bit where where um m is defending bond uh from you know one of the the british ministers or whatever mm-hmm. um who are like well you know bond kind of sucks and he's like he doesn't suck but okay you, you got us mm-hmm. um you know he's defending bond um putting his faith in him Mm-hmm. Which you'd see a lot in the Judy Dench era yeah. of like, no, this is our guy. He knows what he's doing. Let's let him go. Let him run with it. Mm-hmm. Um, which you wouldn't really see a lot until then, but it's cool that you can see that they had this supporting cast who would recur in every movie. So let's give them a little, a little more to do, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, and it works. Yep, and Thank you. Q, come on. <laughs> yeah. He, did he cut, was that a Hawaiian shirt he was in? Uh, yes, it was. <laughs> Q is so good. He's such a lovable square. And he's like, he wears suits to go to work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, he's not like Bond who wears, who wears suits like to be super fashion forward. Mm-hmm. Q is just like, whatever, dude. I just want to tinker around in my lab, make gadgets. <laughs> then I'm going to go out and not get, uh, not get, <laughs> not get a sunburn. Yep. Uh, I'm just, I'm just a super chill dude. I'm Q. You know, mm-hmm. I'll protect you, Bond, but God damn it, stop playing with my stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and, Another uh, actress that came back, but she's playing. She played a, a completely different character, um, uh, uh, Martine Beswick. She played Lola or Nora in From Russia with Love. She one was, of the fighting gypsies. Yeah, one of the fighting gypsies. And Romani, I'm a, so sorry <laughs> to all of the gypsies with Wi-Fi who are offended by. Yeah. And then uh, she played um, Paula in this uh, this one. Which, Paula, which is, is honey, bas- basically is is assistant. Um, it's not implied. It, was, it wasn't implied, but he probably was banging her. Who knows? You know. <laughs> um, yeah, you just assume that Bond banged everyone. Yeah. Uh, so uh. Um, she was she was uh, gorgeous looking, but R.I.P. Though I was like, wow. Yeah, R.I.P. Uh, um, but she'll be back. You know, she'll play another fighting gypsy one day. Yeah. She's fighting gypsies in heaven. <laughs> no. uh, speaking of banging, uh-huh. we gotta mention probably the uh, Bond's worst, worst banging ever yeah. at the health club, played by Molly Peters. Um, it was uh, so gorgeous. Patricia, Patricia, Patricia Fearing. That was her character's name. Yeah. She's gorgeous, but, like, it is the closest to, like, just, like, nasty, coerced sex yeah. that you get in the whole series. Where yeah. he's like, hey, babe, you want to bang? And she's like, no, fuck yeah. you, Bond. <laughs> and he goes, oh, well, okay. And then they try to assassinate him Yeah. <laughs> with that kind of hilarious machine I'm like, that I don't know what it does. That's what I'm saying. Did they make that? That was a made-up machine, isn't it? Like, it was, are they- are they making him dry hump to death? <laughs> I don't know what's happening there. That must be a 60s thing. Yeah, probably. Um, and, and then she finds him and saves him. 
and he's out cold, and he wakes up, and he's like, oh, no, oh, I almost died. Mm-hmm. Oh, man, you almost let me die. I guess now if we don't have sex, I'm going to report you, and you're going to get fired <laughs> and live on the streets forever. And she's like, uh-oh, this is bad. I guess I need to have sex with this guy or else he's going to get me fired. <laughs> and then, boom, you see her butt in the shower. Yep. Um, it was just... Uh... One of the things is she's dubbed in the movie, which is a surprise because I did see her do interviews and she sounded like she spoke perfect English, but whatever. Yeah, she sounds great in the commentary. So I don't know why they dubbed her, but whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I when I saw the scene, I was like, oh, this is probably the scene he was talking about. But at the she same time, well. at the same time, she did not look unhappy to do it, you know? <laughs> well, that's, the th- that's, the, that's what Bond always gets away with. <laughs> Because they're always satisfied afterwards, yeah. not to be gross. <laughs> it's they're like, it's they're spe- like, this didn't start out very well, but it ended really well. Especially if the time where he's like, after he sort of went outside to do some investigating and he found the dead body and he uh, turned on the fire alarm. So he's walking back and another girl comes out and she looks gorgeous too. And he's like flirting with her. <laughs> and then... Her character, uh, Molly Peters' character, comes out and then she's like really upset that he's flirting with her. It's like, oh my god, he really got her shook up. <laughs> yeah, man, it's the power of the the Bond penis. Yeah, it's good, uh, it's good girth. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, 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 Felix. They changed Felix again. They changed him again. They're gonna change him almost every time. And it's like. So, can we officially say Jeffrey Wright has played Felix more times than any other? Yes. I can't remember the name of the actor who played him in Live and Let Die and License to Kill. Yeah. But I think he was the first one to, to play him more twice. than once. Yeah, yeah. And, and there were Felix's in between. Yeah, so Jeffrey Wright played him in Casino Royale, Quantum. Was no he way, Sc- just those two. Was he's not he wasn't in Skyfall? No. Wasn't in um Spectre? I don't think so. I know he's coming back for Bond twenty five, they did say as much. They 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 mention his name mm-hmm. but uh I don't think that he's appeared more than twice yet. Hmm. I'll look into but it after. Maybe he'll get there, he'll yeah, get there. Yeah. Um and then let's get on to the Bond girls now. Uh, you, uh, we mentioned Molly Peters up front. Um, then there's, uh, what's her name? The Italian one. Uh, Lu- Luciana Paluzzi. Yeah, my she girlfriend. Plays, she plays Fiano. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I was confused while I was watching the movie. Luciano... And Lucia, Luciana, sorry, and uh, uh, Claudine, they kind of look alike. So when I saw Domino, I thought it was Lucy. Yeah. I thought it I was like confused because it's like the first time, the first one you do see is, is, is Volpe, right? That's yeah. when she's um, with the pilot. She's flirting with him, uh, in bed mm-hmm. with him. And then. When you see uh, that Bond is on his mission to find the sister of the pilot, um, uh, I, I saw her. I was like, "Wait a minute!" So was Volpe the sister? So I was kind of confused, and then it took me a while. I was like, "No, it can't be. It's, it's, a, it's someone different." And then you, the car, uh, when when Bond is like doing like the uh, surveillance of the shipyard, or, and then he he goes on shore and then he picks uh he hails the car and it turned it, it was volpe i was like wait so is that domino and then but when he act when she was like oh what's your name i was like no it's, it's not domino so yeah right. for a first spiel i was like i was confusing the two they look alike uh, just the way how their their hair was styled um i mean yeah but fiona's a, a redhead yeah but it was like in certain lights you couldn't ne- you didn't notice if if uh like when it was underwater the first time you saw Domino, you wouldn't, you weren't able to tell if it was a red or not. Yeah, you know. Uh, but also, and then when she know, got out to the boat, gigantic boobs that yeah. Domino doesn't have. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. um, so Claudine Auger, she plays um, 
uh, Domino, and she was also dubbed over. Uh, but uh, not Luciana. Luciana, that was her. Uh, and she she actually uh, auditioned for um, for Domino. Domino. Yeah. Um, and they told her, well, there's good news and bad news. The bad news is you are not um, going to play Domino. But the good na- news is you're going to be the villain, one of the villains. And she was like, oh, yay, happy. I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and she's so good. She, uh, Fiona Volpe left an impression on me. Yeah. Yeah, let's just leave it at that. Yeah. yeah. But, like, there's that, I mean, she gets a lot of mileage out of out of her cleavage in this movie. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, she's so overtly sexual in a way that a lot of Bond girls haven't been. Mm-hmm. Like, they've been, like, mysterious and aloof and powerful in their own way. And they've been, you know objects and and you know decoration in their own way yeah and maybe because she's so overtly a villain mm-hmm. and, and she's the first hot bond villain because there's or you know bond female villain because there's a lot of Lania, but she was a little older mm-hmm. at that point let's just see uh mm-hmm. so she's the first real like bond femme fatale if i'm recalling right. correctly right uh, and like you know, when she blows up the car with her motorcycle, and then takes off the helmet, and just shakes her hair out. It's like, whoa, hello. So that was the confusing part. Why did she kill that guy who was trying to kill Bond? Wasn't he working for the same organization? Um, I don't remember exactly, but yeah, it was like confusing. It was like, because at first I thought it was gonna be a Bond girl that saved them, and then she they would have like an adventure adventures together, but. When she took off her helmet, I was like, wait, isn't she the bad guy? What's happening here? Well, um, there's an explanation in the movie, but... Yeah, I missed uh, it. I probably missed it. It's, you know, it's one of these things where, where uh, we haven't got over that hump yet with the Bond movies where it, it, there's a lot of, okay, just go with it type of moments. You know, whatever. We're just doing a, these silly spy adventure movies before they really start taking them seriously plot wise wise and so i don't know maybe if, if that was a uh, an element to that um where it's just like yeah she killed the bad guy but whatever just go with it she's still the bad guy you know what i mean like are you you know it's probably supposed to confuse you to think well is she the good guy is she the bad guy i don't know um but yeah she, <laughs> bond does get to sleep with her <laughs> and woohoo no, and it's a hot scene, right? Like you only see their faces pretty much, but it's a hot scene. Yeah. So there's a scene. There's a, a part in it after you know she holds the gun on him and brings her henchman in. I have a feeling the line he said that was a famous line, right? Like repeated, where he was like, "Oh, don't act like you didn't enjoy it," and he was like, "Oh, he did it just for his country" or something like that. It's like. Yeah, that's yeah, good. Yeah, he was just basically shaded her terribly by just saying, hey. He's like, he's basically the equivalent of going, I faked all my orgasms. Yeah, he was like, oh, you know, the things I do for my, this is just things I do for Britain, to, uh, for Queen and the Country. I did it for Queen and Country or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and <laughs> So I want to feel like that, when he said that, that was kind of a line that got famous. Uh, I would have to look into it. But when he said it, I was like, oh, snap, he just burnt you. Um, and then, of course, there's Domino. You know what? I love that name, Domino, that if I do have a girl in the future and uh, the mother allows me, I want to name her Domino. <laughs> kind of like how I named Logan. Ah, okay. I just looked it up, and Fiona kills uh, the guys in the car. Mm-hmm. Because she's on orders to kill them, it just happens to work out that they were on their way to kill Bond. So who are those guys? They're, they're not, they were a separate organization? Or they this... are, They're the guy who hired... Uh, that, that's Count Lippy, who hired, uh, who hired Palazzi, the guy who does the body double. Oh, right, 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 right. Uh, mm-hmm. And he's a schmuck. Mm. So they're like, oh, he caused us so much hassle, uh, so 
you know, Largo, you're going to kill him. It's going to be awesome. Mm-hmm. And and you, you're going to kill the guy who hired him. Mm-hmm. That's going to be awesome. That way we can get these schmucks out of our club. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so many. Uh, so it, it just had, Bond got lucky yeah. at that point. And then speaking of Largo, um, actor Adolfo Sell, but he's also dubbed um, by Robert Wrighty. Um, he plays Largo. But the eye patch, you know, you never get away. You know, can always make a good good villain with that eye patch, right? It's like, um, oh, okay. yeah. So, so and it, it helps fit like his pirate theme. Yeah. So even though Blofeld is the main bad guy, we still haven't seen him yet, and Largo is really a henchman, but or number two, the new number two, but he's Largo in essence is the main villain of that movie. Of Thunderbolt, oh, yeah. um, which is we hardly see that kind of. I mean, the Marvel Cinematic Universe sort of did that with Thanos being the overall villain, but like he's sending his henchmen like Loki and uh, uh, Ronan the Accuser. Um, but we haven't seen that in a while, uh, where it's like the henchman is promoted to the main villain of a movie. Oh, I guess right. just he's cutting off one head. I mean, I guess Justice League. Ugh. <laughs> with, with Stephen Wolf. <laughs> uh, it's so bad. <laughs> so um, yeah. Uh, but then people still cheered in the audience when they, when he says, "Oh, I will help you, my brother, Dark Side." And everyone's like, "Woo!" And it's like, "Shut up! He's not even in the movie. All he did was say his name." Yeah. You're like the guy at the Bethesda press conference. Oh yeah. Woo! <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So. Uh, the plot of Thunderbolt Ball is they, I guess they captured a prototype or, or a cap- prototype sh- uh, nuclear carrier or whatever, or was that a regular plane, whatever? But they it had nuclear warheads. Yeah, I mean it's pretty straightforward. It's yeah. it's they they've got Spectre steals the bombs. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bond's got to get the bombs back. Mm-hmm. Along the way, he's got to you know. Domino is kind of key to undermining Largo, mm-hmm. so he's gonna bang her so that Largo gets mad. <laughs> yeah, uh, and and there's like the connection because like her brother went missing, yeah. Uh, yeah, and you know was killed and replaced by the Spectre agent with the plastic surgery. Mm-hmm. Which... That cool shot with the rear projection where he sees himself. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty cool, but um. You know, like most of the best Bond movies, like the story is not a spy story; it's just a straightforward action adventure. Mm-hmm. Let's put Bond in an exotic locale, mm-hmm. give him some stuff to do, uh, and let's get him from from action sequence to action sequence as efficiently as possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it also, you know, it has that good drama in between that never get becomes like overwrought or too overbearing. Mm-hmm. But it's like, hey, let's actually have a scene here with, uh, you know, a really sexy scene with Fiona Volpe. Yeah. Or, like, let's have a, a, the, um, and like we mentioned earlier, it gets so much mileage out of its underwater scenes. Yeah. Um, you know, they shot in the Bahamas, so they're like, we got to go underwater. Yeah. And that is, that's, yeah. And they had the actual, they had sharks in the water for real. Which is crazy. Um, you know, nowadays they'll use CG. <laughs> or they'll use some creative way of having a real shark, but impose it, superimpose it into the scene. But no, they had a real shark. And apparently they had the uh, actual strings tied to the shark so that when it gets close enough to the stunt players, they just pull the shark away. Um, Bond himself almost got ate by, <laughs> ate by a shark. And you can see it. Yeah. You can see it when, he, when he's getting out of that pool. Yeah. Um, the the shark is like is right on his ass. Yeah. And as, as soon as he, he steps out, it turns away because it's like, ah, I missed him. Yeah. Missed him by that much. Um, oh, I think we, we do. We should mention that in the shark pool, mm-hmm. uh, the conditions weren't super great. And a couple of sharks did die. Uh, uh, which really sucks because that's a thing that I get very upset at. Hey, this is the thing. I don't think the the animal. What was it? We call them animal. Right. 
animal ASPCA yeah. animal rights. Yeah. People. I mean, I may be wrong, but I don't think they were sort of, like, around or big back then in the 60s. Because the even with the scene with the shark in the, in the war scene on the water, when he the shark got shot with the spear, that is not a special effect. That shark got shot. <laughs> it didn't bleed, though. There was a, well, they talked to the special features how they, they had to use real guns, underwater guns. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, they they used those real underwater guns, mm-hmm. but they did modify them and they modified the bolts. Like they put rubber on the end so that they couldn't actually puncture anything. Right, right. And they um, they put extra barbs on them so that they wouldn't travel as fast. Right. Um. So whenever I, like when the shark gets shot and bleeds, that's fake. Mm-hmm. But there is that amazing shot where the shark is going right at these guys. Mm-hmm. And they shoot it, and you can see the bolt like bounce off it, mm-hmm. and it and it, you know, Turns. just immediately yeah. goes in the other direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like you can't fake that. Yeah. <laughs> like there might be some trickery, like maybe they, you know, attracted it one way or the other, or they had a string on it or something mm-hmm. to get it to change direction. But um, the way the director, underwater director, said, he's like, I think that they just got so scared that they just shot the shark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, to try and get it to go away, and it worked, yeah. which is very good because none of my stunt guys got eaten. Yeah, because them sharks look scary, man. Like mm-hmm. even when like one of them was fourteen feet long. Oh my god! When Bond went under to to when he first discovered the plane, and you just see the sharks just like hanging out there. It's like that was just terrifying, man. Like wow. Uh, but yeah, the. Basically, 25% of this movie was underwater. And it's like, yeah, they they did so well uh, with it. I mean, (laughs) you know you were going to get some cool underwater scenes from the opening credit sequence. Yeah. Uh, Which, I guess, is the first one to feature naked ladies? Yeah, we got naked silhouettes, under naked underwater silhouettes. Yeah, I mean there were some scenes, especially I, I guess back in the day, you you didn't necessarily notice, but when you're doing HD, yeah, you can you can see the parts. Yeah, you're seeing in parts. HD, yeah. HD parts. Yeah. And speaking of that, there was uh, if you go back to watch maybe the in subsequent releases of uh, Jaws, the opening sequence with the the lady in the water she's naked she's complete and that movie's pg she's completely naked i'm sure when the movie came out uh you know like in theaters or when it came out on home video when it was time to come out on home video because in 70s they didn't have such a thing nah, not yet um but when they do they come out on home video you n- you didn't necessarily see it but when it they released it uh in HD, and that scene, cameras moving up, and you definitely she was naked, and you could see it that she was naked. Um, so yeah, that, that's one of the things when you're seeing the opening sequence of this thing, uh, the opening credit sequence, and I'm like, oh, look at all those boobages. Um, so yeah, it- and, and that opening sequence, I mean, Tom Jones, one of the greats. One of the great bombastic barrel-chested singers of all time. So yeah, let's uh, talk about that. So I, you told me that uh, he fainted at the end of that song. You can hear it. You can hear it in the last note. Yeah, and you know what it is. You know what? If you didn't tell me, I probably wouldn't have noticed. But because you told me and I was listening for it, I I was like, oh shit, that's what he did. Yep. <laughs> he he like lost his footing. It was just like that's it. That's all you're getting out of me. <laughs> So the the story behind that song is that they couldn't come up with a song that used the word thunderball because it's a nonsense word that doesn't mean anything. Right. <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know, you want to go, uh, ooh, I can write a Bond theme based on just the title alone. And we've seen that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Goldfing- uh, Goldeneye is mm-hmm. based on the title of that movie. It, U2, U2, Bono and the Edge 
had no idea what the movie was other than that title when they wrote that song. Right. Uh, and they're like, Thunderball, we can't really write anything about that. <laughs> so they first wrote Mr. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, which was named after um, Bond's nickname in Italy. They mm-hmm. called him that. Right. Uh, Kiss Kiss for the the grown-ups and Bang Bang for the kids. <laughs> um, and it was sung by Dionne Warwick, mm-hmm. who is adored and beloved. And it's why they go to the Kiss Kiss Club midway through the movie. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and the name Kiss Kiss Club was later used in the um, the video game Everything or Nothing. Ah. Fun, fun fact there. But um, they, they had a contingency plan because they were like, well, this might be confusing if it's a song that's not the title of the movie. Mm. So the song will have a long instrumental opening. And on one of the uh, commentary tracks, they play the opening titles with the original song. Mm-hmm. And it lines up perfectly. Right. Uh, and they do it in such a way that the lyrics don't begin until after the title Thunderball is shown on screen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But then at the last minute, they were like, no, no, no. The song needs to be called Thunderball. I don't care how you do it. Just do it. <laughs> so they... They came up with a couple different versions. Uh, and one of the most famous is Johnny Cash, of all people. Like, yeah. salt of the earth, country western Johnny Cash, rock and roll guy, mm-hmm. did, recorded a song called Thunderball. Mm-hmm. And it's pretty good, but pretty weird. And you can find, like, YouTube edits of the, the song put on top of the, uh, the sequence. Right. And it's a good song, it just doesn't fit, fit. <laughs> it's not a bond song yeah you know it's like the classic johnny cash boom chicka boom chicka boom <laughs> style mm-hmm. uh and it's just it would be weird uh and i think they ultimately made the right choice with the tom jones song i mean it's great he's basically the white shirley bassey yeah <laughs> um and it's a, it's a great under you know underrated because he's one of the few men to sing a, a Bond song mm-hmm. and they're generally associated with women mm-hmm. um, it, generally not always obviously some of the best ones uh, have been done by men but um, you oh. don't immediately yeah. think of any of the male yeah. Bond themes yeah uh, cause the, men, the male singers there's Tom Jones for this one there's Live and Let Die Paul McCartney Paul yep. McCartney there's um, View to a Kill by Duran Duran. Duran, Duran. Uh, I know. And then uh, Chris Cornell. Yes, for for uh, Casino Royale. And, yeah. um, and Sean. And uh, no. Sam. Sam Smith. That's the first gay man to ever sing, a, to ever do whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, we, we kid so, so Sam Smith. <laughs> because he, he when he won the Oscar for the best original song, he was like, I think I'm the first openly gay man to win an Oscar. And it's like, are you kidding me, dude? <laughs> uh, and then uh, where the joke was, he had that song that sounded just like I Won't Back Down by Tom Petty. Right. Uh, and so I was on the first openly gay man to sing a Tom Petty song. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, we have kids, Sam Smith, he's great, mm-hmm. and I do like that song. Uh, kind of like it's weird, it's weird, mm-hmm. but I like it very much. His his Bond song. Yeah, yeah. Um, I like it more than Adele's. Uh, hey, look, I'm I'm trying to be Shirley Bassey. Look, I'm trying to be a throwback. I'm so great. <laughs> look at me. Whatever. I like that song. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. You would, Mark. You would. I like all. Basically, I like the songs. That sound like a Bond movie. Mm. Um, once in a while, I like I would like a song that doesn't like I, the Chris Cornell song. It's a good song, but I w- I don't listen to it as often because it doesn't really sound like a ah, Bond. See, I love that one. Um, I love World Is Not Enough because that sounds like a Bond movie. I love uh, Golden Eye because it sounds like a Bond movie. Um, I like Live and Let Die. Not so much View to a Kill. View to a Kill just sounds like an 80s, here, uh, 80s like pop song. 
That's uh, fair enough. Uh, that, that, that's uh, you know because there are the, those two different approaches. It's like do you do a song that fits the Bond theme, and a few Bond themes have incorporated like the Bond riff into mm-hmm. them. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, when they do when they incorporate the riff, sometimes I find that a little too, as the kids say, try hard. Right. Uh, and I find I find Adele's theme a little bit too try hard for for, for me. I mean. Uh, like like I like I like it when they're like we're fitting the character of Bond that not necessarily yeah. his aesthetics. Yeah, I, I I guess the reason is true. It sounds tri- like they deliberately, and I think they even mentioned it at some point that they wanted to do a traditional Bond song only because yeah. it was the the movie represented the fiftieth anniversary, and they wanted to right. bring back and because elements. the previous two or even three songs, including Madonna. Uh-huh. Um, you know, we're not in that mold. Yeah, but you know what's funny though with the Madonna song "Die Another Day," it it works as both. That's why I actually like that song. It works as a pop song. Like if you listen to it, you didn't, you won't necessarily think Bond, but when you watch it in a Bond movie, you're like, oh, I see it. It works really well yeah. in, in context of that movie, right? Because the like it with starts the scorpions and the ah, oh, not too much, and then the, it starts. Diana, the the song starts when uh, his they're torturing the head in the water. Yeah, and it just and then it's like oh shit, and you hear the bring 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 bring. It was like oh shit, it sounds just like a, a Bond song. But then you know once you hear bang, 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 it was like oh yeah, that's a pop song. But it yeah. also works. It, it also works. That's I like. And like song. and and to be honest, for me like. There are very, very few Bond songs that I dislike. Mm-hmm. I don't know if there's any that I really dislike, because like they all fit within their movie. It's not. I didn't like the From Russia with Love so much. It was just well, it's, funny cause it's weird because that one plays at the end. Yeah, it's which funny. Is a weird spot for it, but um, maybe like the the end credit song of of. Uh... Which one was the? Uh, it had like the. That's um, you only live twice. Yeah, I don't like uh, Nancy that. Sinatra. Yeah. Oh. That's a good one. Oh. But uh, <laughs> um, but but really, for for me, I I do I do like all of them. It's just which ones do I like more than? Yeah, others? I mean, you know, like for, this, they're not yeah. terrible songs. None of them are. None of them are. Um, it's just I prefer the more cinematic ones. <laughs> yeah, you know, um. Tomorrow never dies is a good one. Um, tomorrow never dies. Oh, I've got I've got to talk about tomorrow never dies <laughs> and the songs plural. Oh, wow. But we'll get we'll get to that right. in like fifteen weeks. Yeah. Um. Oh, so another thing I want a couple of things I want to mention about uh, Thunderball. The the John Kunu scenes. When I saw it, I was like, oh, it brought me brought me back because he has John Kunu in um, Jamaica as well. Which is a scary little thing. It's like basically Mardi Gras and Holly, ha- Halloween smushed together. Um, that carnival uh, celebration. It they didn't make it as scary in the show in a movie. It was it just played more like a carnival, a uh, carnival parade than actual like you know like Jean Cunu. They put on masks and and weird creatures and stuff like that. So it's kind of scary. When I was a kid, I remember uh, when they used to have John Kunu in Jamaica. like, And they showed it on TV. I was like, oh, yeah, that's scary. I don't want to go. <laughs> so it's like, a, it's like a rave that takes over the whole street. Yeah. So um, it, was, it was cool to see that. It's a Caribbean thing, so obviously it's in the Bahamas. So, um, And then the second thing, <laughs> another inspiration from uh, for uh, Christopher Nolan where he got the sky hook scene in oh, yeah. Dark Knight. Yeah. Um, so he's like a James Bond fanboy to the end, man. He got mm-hmm. the the snow sequence in Inception from uh, uh, On Our Majesty's Secret Service. He got the sky hook scene from this movie for Dark Knight, the Dark Knight. I think what, did he get the the Dark Knight Rises the the plane sequence? Did he get it from a I want to say he got it from one of the Bond movies. There's a lot of plane action, but uh, that specifically, uh-huh. well, there are, there is like the mid-air hijacking of the space shuttle, and you only live twice, but it's not quite the same. Right, right, right. 
Like, it is a really, really cool shot. We'll get to that yeah. next week. But uh, basically, the space shuttle gets eaten. Mm. <laughs> and then they do that. They homage that in uh, one of my favorites, The Spy Who Loved Me, oh, okay. when the submarine gets eaten. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that Skyhook se- sequence uh, at the end of... Metal Gear Solid as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. The balloons, the Fulton recovery. Oh, another thing that was pretty cool was that yacht, man. They actually built it, right, to separate and do that. And that that whole, you know, more than this is the first one, you know, even even way more than Goldfinger, mm-hmm. which is shot pretty plainly. Mm-hmm. That has like an like a war at the end. Yeah, right. <laughs> like, like you see bolts, like you see the the paratroopers drop in yeah. from the plane. You see the Spectre guys underwater, and it's just like. It's like the Revolutionary War. They, they just start going at it. Now, you haven't seen Aquaman yet, right? I have not. Right? I mean, won't spoil anything. But, so, in this, in, in Thunderball, you had the two armies. You had them on, one army on their 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 uh, uh, underwater vehicles. And the other army. And then you're seeing, like, sea creatures, octopus, uh, sea serpents, and sharks, and stuff like that. Basically, the sequence in Aquaman is like that, but like I guess blown up. So I was when I was watching, it, I was like, "Oh yeah, James Wan probably." I mean, I'm I, probably not, but I'm sure if if I heard that J- James Wan saw said, "Hey, my sequence was inspired by Thunderball," I would not be shocked. Just the way how it was framed with the two armies going against each other and the sort of single shots of like different sea creatures and stuff like that. It's pretty much what happened in Aquaman. I was like, when I watched it again, I was like, oh shit, this is like, like I won't, I, I'm not gonna call it a low budget Aquaman because this came before Aquaman, so I gotta give it more respect. And it was shot under different circ- circumstances than Aquaman, so again, more respect. But uh, you know, it if you were to watch Aquaman, then this, the, you know, the uneducated would look at it and be like, oh yeah, it looks like a, a lower version of Aquaman, that battle sequence. But right, yeah. but I think like it, it you know, it, it doesn't take that much like just appreciation. Like, mm-hmm. if you're if you're just, you know, so lowest common denominator that if you fill the screen with CGI, you mm-hmm. go wow, right. then you'd see it. But like, I can't imagine showing someone again not having seen Aquaman, and, mm-hmm. and like I love you know good CGI effects, mm-hmm. and like there's so much compositing. You know, I don't, I have no idea how they did all the underwater action. An Aquaman, but I'm sure it's yeah. exhausting. Yeah, yeah. But you know, it's a little bit more dangerous and a little harder, and takes a different skill set. But throwing guys underwater and making them fight, yeah, with that holds up. Yeah, and with the the, the creatures, the creatures were alive for crying out loud. Like I wouldn't. I, would... I know they're fighting, and like there's like a like a lobster, or whatever yeah. that is, just like walking by. That creeped me out too. It's like because when it would just look so big, and it's like, it's like, oh my mm. god. And but... that really, and that scene like kind of segues into the big final fight on the um, on the deck or yeah. the the command yeah. deck, the bridge. Mm-hmm. That's the word yeah. of the the ship with Largo and the captain and a couple other guys, which is. Not Peter Hunt's farewell because he would stay on, but Terrence Young's like last hurrah. Mm-hmm. Basically, this is the last Bond movie that he directed. Oh, it is. Oh, shit. yeah, mm-hmm. I know. Uh, and he goes, he says something like, in in one of the commentaries, he says, "Yeah, I did the first one. I did the second one. I did this one." People were like, uh, "You know, oh, how come you didn't stay on to do more?" And he's like, "Cause I already did them." Yeah. Yeah, this movie was the very definition of firing in all cylinders for for uh, for Terrence Young. Like, he just went all out with this movie. This movie really feels like a big-budget action movie. Even to a uh, standard of the 60s, you know what I mean? Like, you could play this along with some of the top action movies in the 90s, and it still would hold up, you know what I mean? It's, it's so good. And that, that scene is just like... You know, on the bridge with one on one against Largo, mm-hmm. 
I think that w- one of the things that this movie does so well is that animosity between Bond and Largo. Mm. Uh, kind of building off of Goldfinger. He's kind of a combination of Goldfinger, Red Grant, and Dr. No. Right, right. Uh, so he's, he, he could be Blofeld and people wouldn't really mind. Yeah, yeah. Like, because he... They have the, the, the meeting before they actually become enemies mm-hmm. in, um, like, Goldfinger. You know, yeah. he's just assigned to look at him. Yeah. And, and they play the cards, or Baccarat, which is, like, a really weird game that has no skill at all. It's is it, like, really basically weird. 21? Is it? Oh, yeah. I kind of, I, I, I think. I have no idea how it's played. Yeah. But, like, they're like, give me the shoe. Here's the shoe. Yeah, I, I think that's I the only know. card game I know how to play is is 21. Well, Go Fish. <laughs> 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 That'd be so good in a Bond movie. It's, it's like, how would you like to play Mr. Bond? James Bond. Go fish. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but but they, they meet that way. Yeah. They you know, they meet playing cards. Then they have like these confrontations where they're both in the same space but are separated. Mm-hmm. Like when he's under the water. Yeah. And Largo's kind of above watching, being like, Are they getting him? Are they getting him? Mm-hmm. And you know, and the whole behind the scenes, like the tug of war with Domino in the middle, a little bit. Just saying, <laughs> Batman, Joker, and Two Face. Uh, uh, yeah, Two Face in the middle. Right. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, there could be. You could draw a line there if you wanted to. Mm-hmm. Um. And then finally, at the end, being like, "Oh man, it's just you and me now." Yeah. And and throwing down like Red Grant in the Orient Express, mm-hmm. and that that fight is so nuts, like it's a little much. Like you can see them running up against the limitations of the time with yeah. the weird projection of the yeah. ocean, like going shit. Yeah, that that was way too fast. <laughs> it's a little. It, it that becomes a little bit silly, yeah. but you kind of. But you get what they were going for, yeah. the idea of it, and you still feel the energy of it, even mm-hmm. if you don't believe the physics of it. Yeah, yeah. Like, no, this is not real. It, that's kind of like a CGI effect, because mm-hmm. you go, I don't believe this, but I like it, and I mm-hmm. want to keep watching. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and that fight, you know, the, there's a bit where he just picks up a chair and throws it at one of the henchmen, mm-hmm. and it's like, he just threw a chair at him. <laughs> Like, the director had to have gone, or Bob Simmons, the stunt coordinator, had to have gone to the guy and been like, Sean Connor is going to throw a chair on you right now. Yeah. It's like wrestling. You just, you know, it's staged, but it's mm-hmm. not fake. Yeah. You can't fake that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the perfect ending to that, where Bond, you know, the fight's not over. Mm-hmm. Bond could still turn it around. But, uh, you know... Largo cheats, he draws a gun, and then boom, shot in the back. The music stops, you just hear the pew. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, oh, I am slaying. So, <laughs> falls down. my question is, and I'm curious to find out when I watch other Bond movies, because I'm not sure, I don't remember. Was this the first or perhaps only Bond where the Bond girl actually killed the main bad guy? Um, let's see. Well, aside from ones like The World Is Not Enough where the woman is the main bad guy um, and the designated girl fights here and there Mm -hmm. like in Die Another Day Mm -hmm. it might be don't quote me on that I I can't go through them all in my head but probably Yeah, I I was curious about that um, because when I saw it I was like, oh wait, she killed the bad guy not Bond like, if she wasn't there, Bond would have been dead, basically. She saved yeah. his life. Um, it's funny, th- there is one in um, in Quantum of Solace, like, the secondary villain mm-hmm. is you know, that, that general who Olga Kurilenko wants to kill. Mm-hmm. In the original script of that, she does kill him in the... Uh, in the in the actual movie, what was he? She shoots the canister and he blows up. Right, right. I think. But in the the original version of that, she was gonna kill him, 
Mm. And you can actually see that version in the uh, in the video game. Oh. Where she she has his gun drawn and he walks towards her and she just blows him away. Mm. Um but yeah, I think you're right. It's the, the only one where like the main villain gets gets killed by the Bond girl. Yeah, I, see I think. But Probably. Yeah, we'll we'll find out for sure when we watch it, but we'll keep that in mind. But for for now, it's like wow, it's thumbs yeah. up. And, but those fights, like that fight, is done so well. Like that's classic Peter Hunt editing mm-hmm. of like, you know, the same as in the Red Grant fight and the rest of the fights in the movie. To be honest, mm-hmm. he just goes. Just, skip all of the the middle stuff Mm -hmm. get straight cut straight to every single hit don't show the guy getting back up we know he's getting back up Mm -hmm. don't show him getting up show him like launching himself after he's halfway up yeah yeah um although i gotta say like (laughs) even though it's the last fight in the movie i and and it's like you know huge and an epic ending for the movie Mm -hmm. not the best fight in the movie kind of have to go the opposite the best fight in that movie is the very first one with the the specter assassin who they're at his funeral right and then he's disguised as his own widow oh right yeah so we didn't talk about that too the cold open um it's so, so the cold open that was a specter assassin yeah yeah okay yeah, like basically like so much of this movie to me maybe it's just it's just my head cannon mm-hmm but I feel like, like, Terrence Young saw that um, Goldfinger set a formula, mm-hmm. and he goes, "Oh, okay, I see how Goldfinger set the formula. I'm gonna show you how you do that formula my way." Yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna do that formula, but with the gravitas and style of From Russia with Love and Doctor No. Hey. And. And and like the cold open, it's like we're gonna do your cold open a million times better. Yeah, yeah. Instead of like a, a fight scene that's like really old timey, one really long shot basically of Bond and the guy with their shoulders on, you know, their hands on each other's shoulders, mm-hmm. and then the admittedly really awesome, you know, finishing move, you know, shocking. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna start with just a like a dirty, nasty brawl. Mm-hmm. We're gonna break every single thing in this room. Yeah, they break every single thing in that room. They either they throw each other into it, mm-hmm. or they pick stuff up and throw it at each yeah, other. Yeah, it's so good. It, like, I'm playing Yakuza or I'm playing Judgment right now, the video game. Yeah, and it reminds me of that. <laughs> like, wow. video games have gotten to the level of Thunderball. So it's funny, right? Um, back in the days when you saw a poster of a movie and the poster has you know crazy looking styles and stuff like that you're like oh man that movie must be awesome and when you watch it it was like oh man it's nothing like the damn poster it sucks right this movie was made during the time where a poster hyped the movie way more than it it, it is but if you so saw they, they were painting yes There's art on their own so then but the poster for this i could say it matched exactly what you saw in the movie because the poster had Bond, well, one of the posters anyway, had Bond with the jetpack on, and he's like, you know, debonair, and he has the gun in his hand, and he's flying towards the screen, and in the background you see like the big bo- uh, yacht, uh, like coming towards the screen, and then like sharks under it, and then like some explosions here, and some Bond babes over here, and it's just like, wow, that looks amazing. It looks like total action piece with crazy stunts and beautiful women and. And, 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 and crazy uh, uh, vehicles. I can't wait to see that. And when you watch the movie, you saw that. I was like, holy mm-hmm. shit. Like, it's, it's a, the poster was an accurate representation of what you were going to see Absolutely. in the movie. And that, that, cold open, that cold open could have ended with Bond throwing the, the flowers on the guy and being like, you bitch, <laughs> uh, in so many words. I forget what his actual one-liner is, if he even has one. But that's so good. Like, he, he killed... And a nasty kill. He's got the fireplace poker and snaps his neck mm-hmm. with it. It's like, yeah. And I think that that's a response to the comparatively tame violence in Goldfinger. Mm. Like, yeah, he kills people, but in that, but it's never like yeah. 
Not that him. brutal, like in From Russia with Love. Mm -hmm. So it might just be him returning to his style, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that Peter Hunt and uh, uh, Terrence Young style. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, I I can't help but to see it as as course correction. Yeah. After Goldfinger. Um, and, and, and I like Goldfinger very much. We've established this, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, <laughs> okay? Yeah. But, um, you know, the, the, that cold open could have ended there, mm -hmm. throws the flowers on him, opens the door, closes it, smash to the song. Mm -hmm. But no, he has to get on a real jet pack. <laughs> and that's not a special effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's not strings. Yeah. That's not like one of those water things that they do with the, with the rope or whatever. That is an actual working jetpack. Yeah, they hired one out of the two uh, guys at the time that were able to fly those those things. It was supposed to be like a prototype for the military or something like that. And they wanted him to do it without the helmet. Yep. Because uh, it was, you know, they wanted it bond to the cool. But it was like, absolutely not. I'm not doing that. <laughs> There's no amount of money you can pay me to make me do that. And he... That's why like, you can tell in the shot wh where he puts on the helmet that it's a rear projection background yeah. that they did it in reshoots. Yeah. They're just like, ah, oh, Sean, we need you back for a day. And it's yeah. like, what do I have to do? Uh, just put on a helmet. It's yeah. fine. <laughs> okay, whatever. I just, I'm just showing up to work. Yeah. And even for that small pit time, I didn't get the name of the actual girl, but like, she looked pretty beautiful as well. <laughs> um,. But yeah, this the movie was, and I have to give kudos as well to Ken Adams, man. Like he outdid himself Stats. on this one. Um, he, uh, cause is one of the things he said. One of the things he said when he designed like some of the underwater uh, vehicles, he said like, mm, "Wonder if someone can build these things." And then when someone said, oh, yeah, I can build it, like, from there, he, his com confidence grew where he was like, oh, I guess I could just design anything. And someone someone out there would be able to build it. And I think from there is where he just went crazy and just start building shit no matter what. That yeah. someone be, would be able to build it. Kind of a really interesting thing that they mentioned in the commentaries. Mm-hmm. Is that like the silliness, the inherent silliness of some of the more over the top aspects of Bond, mm -hmm. whether it's the one liners or the outrageous sets, mm -hmm. uh, were done like we're not a side effect or not a thing that look dated now. Yeah. Like they were by design. Mm -hmm. Like they talk about how Terrence Young and Ken Adam did these things so that they could be in on the joke. Yeah. Like they, they, you know, had the Spectre agents dress all in black and had the heroes dress in, like, gaudy orange mm -hmm. so that there would be no delusion as to which side is which. And, like, he made the, the set where Blofeld fries the guy uh, have open up so that the chair goes down mm -hmm. to be, like, a joke. Yeah. Like, that is, su that is supposed to be funny. Mm -hmm. Like, you're not cool for laughing at something. Yeah. You know... <clears throat> Like if you think you're laughing at it, it's laughing at you mm -hmm. because you're laughing at it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, like, basically, don't be cynical. Yeah. Everything is awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, all of the, and so many of the one liners are inside jokes. Like, apparently, the line where she's like, when will I see you again? Sometime, someplace, anytime, any place. And he mm -hmm. says, another time, another place. <laughs> which is the first movie that Sean Connery was ever in. Oh, okay. Ah, That's the title of that yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's just like, even back then, who was going to get that joke? Yeah. Because they didn't follow actors' careers yeah. not necessarily as intently. Not, <clears throat> not a lot of Easter eggs and meta that we would have gotten. Yeah. And yeah. there's a lot of jokes like that throughout, especially mm -hmm. that early era. Mm -hmm. Um and like the Terrence Young, because like the relationship between Terrence Young and Sean Connery was so at that point mm -hmm. was so uh, like telekinetic mm -hmm. or telepathic. Yeah. Telekinetic. Um, they just had such a good rapport on set, and you know, I could see Sean Connery just uh, mm -hmm. you know, even though he was starting to look a little older at this point, <laughs> he was Bond in a way that. 
that you know other actors get to the point where they are Bond in their own way, mm-hmm. but because Sean Connery was the first one to be Bond, his his portrayal is so impossible. Even if you like other actors better, uh, and and you know I'm someone who just I really do like them all for their own their in their own way. Yeah. Uh, you know the identity of James Bond starts with Sean Connery Mm -hmm. and like no matter how hard anyone tries there's always going to be some degree of not imitation but of living up to the legend of Sean Connery Mm -hmm. and you can see it in especially Thunderball and Goldfinger but also in in the the upcoming ones that we'll see we'll talk about in coming weeks yeah that he is uh so effortless it's almost like he's not acting you know Mm mm-hmm if you told me that Sean Connery was James Bond, I'd believe you. Yeah, he is the he was the Robert Downey Jr. slash Tony Stark of the time. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, and then and I gotta give another shout out again to John Barry. Shout out the his music again, like we mentioned uh, uh, off the top. Um, he just really did his job on it, and it. Again, he's he's sticking. He's probably sticking it to Monty. Monty, what is his name? Monty Norman. Mon, Mon, Monty Norman. Maybe he was sticking, <laughs> sticking it to him. But he hardly used the James Bond score throughout the movie. <laughs> he yeah. Just, yeah. He used the. Uh, you hear the theme, where they had the covering up of, of the ship a lot. There's a uh, another one. Uh, that uh, was playing throughout, but you hardly hear that classic Bond theme. I mean, you hear it, but you hardly hear, hear, hear it. It was just like, I'm going to give you my themes. I'm going to make it my own. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it, was, it was incredible. Um, yeah, so... Kid, it was uh, So far, it's the best one, I would say, that we've seen out of the four. Best one, most expensive one out of the four. Um, longest one out of four, and made I think he made the most money out of the oh, four. Yeah. yeah, made the most money out of all of them. Uh, you know, infl- inflation. Yeah, we yeah. had that talk. Yeah, but um, uh, but yeah, it's it, it was an incredible movie. Um, still holds up because like like I said, when I was watching it now, I didn't have to put my '60s blinders on that much. You know, in small cases here and there, but for the most part, it felt like an action movie you would see today. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, you know, and and it, you can see where directors like Cameron and Nolan, you know, got inspired from, like especially James Cameron, who just loves the sea <laughs> for some reason. Yeah, he loves doing underwater shoots. Uh, you know, he eventually, I get, you know, he he outdid what Terrence Young did in this with uh, the Abyss and Titanic. You know, like yeah, he really did. Yeah, so. Um, you know, you. He was surprised, but you you got to give credit to Terrence for even thinking about doing an underwater shoot like this. You know what I mean? It's just like most of your films is under uh, underwater. I can't imagine. And it's and here's the thing: movies aren't like made like how they used to with, with big ten pole films, right? Big big ten pole. Pulp films they shoot the year to be released the year after or maybe even two to sometimes two years after the bond movies in the, the earlier bond movies they were shooting the year they're supposed to come out that's the amazing thing about them you know what i mean like yeah we gotta make it by christmas so chop chop you know <laughs> and and the, that you know we've seen movies under that kind of deadline struggle creatively Mm -hmm. right like anytime they go oh our script wasn't done yet Mm -hmm. when we started Mm -hmm. you go oh that's not a good sign yeah but some and 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 again gotta give it up to my guy peter hunt yeah who you know after the movies were done did what editors can do and was like i'm gonna put this scene over here i'm gonna switch this scene around Mm -hmm. uh because it makes it because I think it makes it flow better and sometimes it creates continuity errors right but it's worth it because it tells the story better like would you rather 
have a better movie or would you rather have a movie with fewer continuity errors? Mm-hmm. I'd rather have a better movie. I, you know, you have to be, uh, you know, either you just happen to spot continuity errors or you're looking for them. Yeah, most of the time you don't know. People who find these co- continuity and errors. And if you're looking are... for them, it means, A, you're watching the movie a whole bunch of times, yeah. which means the movie won. Yeah. You're not beating the movie if you find the errors. Yeah. Because if you're watching it five times to find them, then the movie beat you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, like, who cares? Mm. Who cares if Bond's hair is parted on the, the other side every once in a while? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and who cares if there's that one scene where Felix is wearing long pants and is then wearing short pants in the very next shot? Yeah. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's hey, Bond, it's 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 running on top of his game, so you know you gotta forgive it for some of these absolutely. Uh, uh, one last last piece of weird trivia mm-hmm. is that I'm not sure why they changed it, mm-hmm. but the next movie after Thunderball was supposed to be on Her Majesty's Secret Service, and I cannot imagine what it would be like if Sean Connery had played Bond in that movie. Holy cow. But yeah. they ultimately changed their mind and did You Only Live Twice next. Mm-hmm. Not 100% sure why. But the, um, the credits end really weird. Like, it feels like it gets cut off before they end. Like, the crawl. The, oh, the for Thunderball? Crawl. Yeah. Yeah, he did. He did, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's because uh, the part of the legend is that you know the way they always end with Bond will return, return in dot dot yeah. dot. Yeah. It, it said Bond will return in on Her Majesty's on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Mm-hmm. Really hard for me to say that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then in like re-releases, when you know when that didn't happen, yeah, they cut they, it off. They cut it out. Mm-hmm. But um, the original footage was lost. Oh. Uh. Oh. Um, and that movie, it's like, there's a, they mentioned it on the commentary. I don't think it's its own special feature, but they mentioned on one of the commentaries that there's a lot of different takes mm-hmm. and different versions of scenes mm-hmm. that are in the different home video releases mm-hmm. up to the 90s. Right. Uh, then when they did the Laserdisc version, that was kind of the the definitive cut. That was when they did the first, like this is the definitive cut of Thunderball as close to the theatrical original as possible. Mm -hmm. But one thing that they couldn't find was the original closing credits. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, Maybe, I don't know if uh, they had planned to do all the snow sequences and stuff like that from before. Maybe that's why they said, you know what? We're not ready for that. Uh, I'm just speculating. Yeah, maybe I have they're no like, idea. There's like we are not ready for that. Let's do something else. <laughs> I don't know, maybe. Um, uh, yeah. So yeah, Thunderball, and then the next one, You Only Live Twice, is the next film, right? Yep. Um. Uh, so looking forward to that. Uh, see if that holds up. See if it's better than Thunderball. Some parts of it do hold up. Some parts of it do not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's see which one you're talking about. <laughs> Right. You you'll know. <laughs> I don't I don't even want to say the word. Right. But some parts of it do not hold up. <laughs> but some parts of it really 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 do. All right. So that brings us to the end. Um you can uh, find me on uh, Twitter at Marky Tundra. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Pop Culture Galaxy. Where can they reach you at? You can find me at my name Zach Woshner on Twitter. Find me at Zach Woj on Instagram. Uh, you can read my work at ScreenRant.com, mm-hmm. and you can catch my exclusive, I mean, it's not exclusive, it's exclus- exclusively mine, E3 coverage at uh, Extra Life, extra-life.org. Nice, nice. And um, you can subscribe to the channel. Remember to hit that subscribe button, that thumbs up, and that notification bell. bell. The bell. And drop a comment down below. Let us know what you thought of uh, Thunderball. And uh, where does it rank amongst your top movies? We're going to do, like, a overall... Once we finish all our um, Bond movies, uh, we can sort of put them in rank. Let's see. You know, see if we can do our overall ranking. Yeah. Um, or we, we can do it after each uh, after each actor retires. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
Um, and uh, yeah, we talk about our best bonds and what strength and weakness of some of the bonds. We'll have like a special episode once all that done to sort of oh yeah, uh, encapsulate all of those stuff. All right, so uh, until next time, folks. I want to say peace. Indeed.